Please turn to the back of your hymnal to number 716. You'll find the Apostles' Creed there. I would ask that uh, if uh, uh, you believe this and uh, would uh, be willing to make a public profession of it, that you stand uh, and join us uh, as we publicly proclaim uh, these essentials of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, our next hymn uh, is number 425, In the Garden. And I think we're going to sing first, second, and third. <coughs> Oh, 
pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, and uh, uh, we're not exactly in the garden here, but certainly as we approach Easter, and uh, we know that uh, you will be in the Garden of, of Gethsemane. Uh, Father, we, we also know that uh, in our daily devotion uh, that we can uh, be with you uh, in person and in the garden where we, where we can hear from you and talk with you and walk with you, and uh, it is a privilege to be able to do so. Father, we... We ask that uh, you would speak to us this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would, uh, would preside here, that we would experience his presence, uh, Lord, that he would draw us to Christ closer, that he would uh, help illuminate the word to us, Father, that uh, you would help us to understand your plans and your purposes, your promises. Uh, help us to um, continue to be those instruments, those ambassadors, uh, those witnesses that you've called and purposed us to be, that you might be honored and glorified through all that we say and do. Uh, you are the one that we need. We need you all the time, and we're thankful that you are there when you need us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It was very good to see each and every one of you today. Uh, I guess, uh, I, I think I'm finally over this whole um, time change, at least for right now. I know we'll, we'll do it again in around six months or so. And uh, I, will, I alone, um, and maybe you join in me and uh, um, are maybe looking forward to the day when um, uh, we won't be changing times <laughs> twice a year. Um, uh, it, uh, I, I know that in the past there was uh, purposes and reasons for it and um, we probably all have our own opinions in terms of whether or not those purposes are still valid today. Uh, but it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, uh, if you look there in your bulletin, uh, let me just point out a few things here. Uh, uh, we, we are going to have choir practice today. It's going to be at 5 o'clock instead of 4 o'clock. Um, secondly, um, on, the, on an ordinary uh, week, we would have the Wednesday morning Bible study. Um, and we're not going to have it this week. We finished up uh, our uh, Bible study on the English translations of the Bible this past week. And uh, uh, we kind of uh, decided that we were going to, our next study was going to be on the book of James. The book of James uh, in the New Testament there. Uh, and uh, to give me an opportunity to hopefully get prepared for that uh, and to do a little bit uh, of, uh, uh, of preparation along those lines. Uh, we're going to um, not meet uh, this Wednesday, but we will uh, meet again the following Wednesday. And again, we, we will be starting uh, with uh, a study of the book of James. Uh, so we, we invite you, uh, if you are available, uh, uh, to, uh, to come and to join us and to hear and to learn and to fellowship and um, we have a, I think we have a good time. Uh, you can ask the rest of the people, maybe when I'm not around, and, and, and maybe they'll give you an honest answer in terms of how much of a good time they have or don't have. Uh, but I think most of the people have a good time as well. So uh, anyhow, uh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the, the plan uh, for that. Um, we are uh, two weeks out uh, right now uh, from um, Easter uh, and Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and so uh, we are certainly continuing to look forward to as well as prepare for that. Uh, if you look on the inside there of your bulletin, you'll also see uh, the birthdays that we're celebrating this week. Uh, we have two today, uh, Aussie and Cliff Acton. Uh, Cliff is uh, Mary's son, uh, and uh, Mary and um, uh, Preston, uh, who were here for the Sunday School, have left uh, to go home to go ahead and uh, uh, meet them for a meal there uh, in honor of Cliff's birthday. So uh, we're very thankful and wishing them a happy birthday. But also we have uh, Brian, Brian Lynchard, um, Janet's uh, brother Ricky, um, uh, Miss uh, Laura's grandson Carson, uh, and then we're also uh, remembering um, Janet's mom Louise, uh, and also Walton Johnson. Is that? Uh, Judy's dad, okay? Uh, so um, uh, if you get a chance this week to, uh, to see any of those people, uh, either in person or virtually, uh, please go ahead and, and wish them a happy birthday. Are there any other birthdays that uh, are uh, coming up this week that we need to recognize as well? Because this is the opportunity where we can embarrass you, so. All right, no other birthdays. Um, are there any other announcements at this time that we need to bring to the, 
attention of the congregation. There, there's some praise uh, um, reports that we'll bring later on, but um, uh, we'll, okay, good. Now let's um, uh, continue to give all of our attention, all of our praise, all of our worship to the one who is worthy, uh, Jesus uh, of Nazareth, who uh, not only is God, um, but uh, is also our Lord and Savior. Uh, our next hymn uh, is, uh, and certainly it's uh, predicated upon uh, even what we, what we see Jesus doing in the garden, uh, number 371, uh, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And we'll be singing verses. That's a, that's a short one. We'll try it all. Okay, we're going to try them all. Break a record this morning. Break a record. <laughs> Turn to your back of your hymnal one more time for our responsive reading, number 660. 660, and the title of it is Redemption, something that we, I'm sorry, 690. I said 660. Six, oh, it is 660. I'm sorry. 660, Redemption, something that we all need and for those that have put their faith and trust in Christ now have. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to read these passages that are not in bold. Please uh, respond in unison to those that are in bold. Redemption. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. <coughs> but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the promise. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To, to declare, I say, at this time, time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. 
Uh, I remind you that we continue to leave the offering plate back in there on the table in the vestibule if you uh, have tithes or offerings and we're not able to put them in there. As you came in, you certainly can avail yourself of that on the way out. Again, uh, the session did go ahead and meet uh, last week. Uh, uh, Brother uh, Rick and uh, Miss Sadira uh, are our um, finance team, if you will, uh, treasurer and vice treasurer or assistant treasurer, and uh, uh, they do a very good job in terms of um, uh, stewarding um, the the ties and the offerings that we get, as long as, as well as uh, paying uh, the expenses that we have here uh, at the church. Uh, I say all that to say that, one, we thank them. I thank them publicly. I mean, we, we thank them every time that, that we meet. Uh, Brother Rick and uh, Miss Sadira get everything to the penny, uh, which for those of us that are um, uh, detail-oriented like that, uh, we need things to the penny. Uh, and hopefully uh, you as a congregation are grateful uh, for uh, that stewardship as well. Uh, but also uh, to uh, let you know that uh, this church continues to be faithful in its giving. Uh, and uh, we hope then to be faithful <coughs> stewards of those resources, not hoarding them in any way, uh, but using them as God directs us to use them uh, for the ministry here in uh, Cleveland and the surrounding area. Uh, so again, thank you for your faithfulness. Um, we are now going to uh, go into the choir special for today, uh, which is uh, Close to God Medley.
All right, if you uh, take out your bulletin there on the inside on the right, we have um, those that we've been praying for. Um, let me give you just a couple updates. Um, I talked with uh, Viola here on Thursday, uh, and Viola is doing better. Um, and so uh, we are praising God for um, her feeling better. Uh, and uh, she's, um, she's doing well. The family seems to be doing well right now also. Uh, they seem to be free from uh, any uh, COVID or any other um, ailments uh, or uh, viruses or um, bacterium at this point. So um, we're thankful for that. Um, as I speak of that, though, uh, you may have noticed that uh, Mike and Lindan are not here today. Uh, Mike called yesterday. Uh, he's, uh, he caught something. Um, on Wednesday, uh, and he's been trying to fight it off ever since. Uh, he's been uh, taking uh, over-the-counter type things. He did take a COVID test. It came back negative, uh, but uh, he's still not feeling um, um, 100% uh, at this point. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the time that he called me, uh, Lindan was doing okay. Uh, but then last night, I got a text from Lindan that she also seems to have some symptoms as well. So um, whereas we... Uh, uh, rejoice uh, for Viola and the family there and for all the rest of us that uh, currently uh, don't have the flu or pneumonia or COVID or uh, anything else. Um, uh, we are going to be lifting up Mike and Lindan in particular uh, with, um, with what they're going through. I also spoke with uh, Miss Maria this week. Um, she has a doctor's appointment coming up here on Tuesday. Uh, she has a couple of different ailments. Uh, she, she specifically asked that we continue to pray for her son, Anthony, who lives up in Pennsylvania. Uh, he has been diagnosed with cancer and he is undergoing treatments. Um, he's married, he's, uh, he's got, I think he has uh, two or three little girls. Uh, and so um, uh, please keep uh, him in your prayers. Uh, like I said, Miss Maria is supposed to be going to the doctors here on Tuesday uh, for a checkup there. And uh, hopefully she can uh, have some uh, uh, good results there and good diagnoses in terms of some of the other things that, uh, that she's experiencing right now. Um, there may be a praise item or two out there today, so uh, I'll just uh, stop right there and see if there are any other uh, prayer requests or praise items that we would like to bring to the attention of the Lord today. I guess Karen's not going to do it. <laughs> um, uh, we had Presbytery uh, on Friday, uh, and uh, as we have been praying for Karen for quite some time now with regard to this process, uh, towards ordination. Uh, I am very p pleased and very proud and very humbled to tell you that she did exceedingly well uh, in her questioning. Uh, I believe I went back and did the counting. Uh, I think she had six questions uh, that uh, she was asked. And if you want to know what those questions were, you can talk to her and she'd be more than happy to tell you what they were. Uh, or uh, Brother Rick was our delegate. He may remember what some of the questions were as well. Uh, but I, uh, I just want to uh, uh, inform you, for those of you who m may not be on the Google chat and haven't already known, uh, she was approved uh, to be ordained. So the way that the process works now is uh, a commission um, was established. That commission uh, will get together with Karen and uh, uh, set up an ordination ceremony. Uh, it'll be a worship service. Um, it's going to be at New Hope, uh, the same place that uh, I got ordained and where Karen and I got married. Uh, so some of you are very familiar with it, plus it's where we just had Presbytery for the elders who have been there before. Um, uh, right now, I, I believe Karen's shooting for sometime in April. The entire church is going to be invited. Uh, I believe, unless things have changed, she, we're, we're, we are looking at, she's looking at uh, a Sunday afternoon. Um, uh, so that it's uh, after, after any church services, after any session and or fellowship meal that happens to be on the second side of the month, um, uh, but uh, not so late that it's you know, getting into the late evening hours there. Uh, and so uh, there'll be more information coming out on that. Uh, but uh, I know Karen has already extended uh, the thanks to you on the Google chat, uh, but uh, um, we're very thankful. Uh, for your prayers, for your support. I'll also let you know uh, that uh, at, uh, on, on Friday, there was another uh, young man. I call him a young man. And, uh, I, I know he has kids and all that, but still a young man, at least um, to those of us who are maybe a little bit older. 
Um, he was also questioned for ordination, and he did very well also. He had a very good um, sermon message that he uh, presented to us at Presbytery. He's going to uh, get ordained and be installed at the uh, church, the, the, the CP church down in Columbus, uh, which is called Bersheba, Bersheba Church. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, I, the reason I, I, I wanted to bring him up I'm certainly very excited for Karen, both personally uh, as well as uh, from a a pastor, uh, brother in Christ uh, type perspective. Um, but um, uh, it, it, we need good leaders. <laughs> we need good biblically uh, um, inclined leaders. Uh, and um, Karen and Justin both publicly demonstrated that they are that, that their preparation that God has brought them through has prepared them adequately for that. Uh, and with all the various issues that we have going on, going on in our culture as well as in our denomination, uh, it is good uh, to have um, two new uh, warriors uh, to stand beside us uh, as we go ahead and continue um, being the, the message and, and, and the warriors uh, that God has called us to be. So again, huge praise item. Uh, thank you so much. And um, again, if you want to know what those questions were and what the answers were, talk to Karen. She'd be more than happy to go over those again for you. <laughs> Any other praise items or prayer requests? I know there's more out there. Miss Martha. Yes. That's what they do, especially if you're in special forces. Uh, and so, um, yes. Amen, amen, we certainly will. For those of you who uh, may not have heard all that, um, Martha's grandson, uh, John, uh, just recently basically got deployed. He's gonna be uh, out and about for six months, uh, I'm six months, six weeks, uh, and uh, they won't be able to have contact with him uh, for some period of time. So uh, please pray for John, but you know, also include in your prayers uh, all those men and women who are out there serving and the families that are left behind. Uh, it, is, it is not easy. Um, uh, it is a, it, it is a, it, it's very much a call as well uh, to serve in the military and to have somebody in your family who's serving in the military. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, and so uh, we are very grateful, Miss Martha, um, and uh, we certainly will be praying for him and, and for Janet and the family as well. Any others? Don't be shy. Is it spring break this week, girls, or is it next week? Next week? Okay. All right. You still have one more week of school then. I don't care. Everybody's going to be shy. Gailey is back, right? I mean, she's, she's moved back into her. Yes, I talked to her last night, and she's been doing good. Amen. But she failed Wednesday afternoon, and she didn't break anything, but she did mess up her left leg. Okay. All right. So, so let, let's continue to pray for, for Gailey there. Um, speaking of falling, um, is it okay to talk about, uh, okay, well, well, there's two of them back there. Um, so I was talking with Courtney earlier. Her mother-in-law, Jackie, um, went ahead and fell, uh, I guess it was about, uh, about 10 days or so ago, about 10 days or so ago. Um, for some reason, she didn't tell her son or daughter-in-law about it, uh, and uh, she took a big chunk of skin off. Um, and anyhow, they've doctored her up, and she's healing up nicely. Uh, but she's also going to be having uh, knee replacement surgery here towards the end of April. So we need, uh, we need her not to fall anymore there so that she can be uh, prepared for that. 
Uh, likewise, and I appreciate you nodding there, uh, Laura, um, I also got a phone call yesterday from Debbie. Uh, uh, Debbie Spray is doing well. Um, uh, I think last week or the week before, she and Maureen uh, were um, a little bit under the weather there, uh, but Debbie's doing much better. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Maureen fell yesterday. Um, and Susan and Joe took her to the ER. They did x-rays. She has, nothing's broken, and we're praising God for that. But she's got some, um, she's got some bruising um, on various parts of her body, including her face, uh, but, uh, but, but she's doing well uh, at this point. So uh, the girls are doing well. Joe's doing uh, well. Uh, please keep Maureen uh, in your prayers. Uh, is, is, uh, have there been any other updates that I... Uh, not, Good. Okay, good, good. So, so you know, I, I'm, I, I always love those reports where it says there's no pain. <laughs> uh, again, if you've ever had um, a chronic pain and a lingering pain that you can't really seem to get rid of and it just uh, affects your whole life um, 24 hours a day, uh, that's, that can be unbearable. Uh, and so uh, very grateful um, uh, that uh, no broken bones, uh, no broken hip, no need for surgery, uh, slept well and uh, just need some healing now. So, Miss Alma? I do have a prayer. Thank you. <laughs> Last week I asked for traveling mercies for Blake and yes. all his family, and they had both had great trips. Excellent. I think you also shared a praise report on uh, Wednesday at the Bible study about um, uh, a new embryo. Yes. yes. You, you want to bring us up to speed on that? All right. Amen. That's, that's a huge, huge praise item there. All right. Wonderful. It's good to have Brother Mark back. Um, Mary is uh, still uh, under the, uh, the stress of being a school teacher. Uh, and uh, so she's, um, she's dealing with that right now. And so please keep Mary in your prayers as well. Any others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Lord Jesus, we do come to you this morning, and uh, we are humbled uh, by the various ways in, in, in which you move in our lives, uh, even this magnificent creation that you have created for us, uh, not only uh, this, uh, this small little ball that we live on that we call Earth uh, that uh, is so intricately designed, but uh, even the way in which that small little ball fits into your grand story, uh, the universe, and uh, all the various... Uh, seen and unseen things that, uh, that, that you have orchestrated uh, with regard to various laws and principles and uh, just the way in which all of it fits together is just uh, incredibly mind-boggling. We thank you uh, that we do have uh, men and women uh, who have and continue to explore and to uh, um, figure out uh, the ways in which uh, various things uh, work here uh, in your creation and uh, those things which you have provided that are beneficial uh, to our lives, uh, whether it be uh, medicines or uh, various vaccines or uh, even just uh, the natural things that are around us that uh, may be helpful to us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for those discoveries, for uh, them being able to, uh, to uh, see it, find it, and, be, and for us to be able to use it. Uh, Father, we thank you for those who serve, um, John, uh, as well as uh, all the men and women who are actively serving right now. Uh, we thank you for the families. We pray that you would comfort them and give them assurances. Uh, Father, we pray for those in leadership positions in the military, uh, all the way up to our commander-in-chief, Father, that uh, they would be mindful, that they would use wisdom, uh, that they would um, uh, be uh, good stewards, uh, exceedingly good stewards uh, of the resources that uh, these men and women have made available uh, to them. Uh, for us and for all those around the world uh, that we seek to help and to protect. 
uh, Father, we, uh, we thank you for those that have served, those who have uh, given their lives, uh, those sacrifices uh, that uh, they would not go unnoticed uh, or unwelcomed. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for healing that you bring to uh, our bodies. We thank you for those in our own congregation and those that uh, are experiencing joy, uh, even this, this uh, new family now with a new life that is growing within her womb. Uh, we thank you for life, Lord. We thank you for uh, the, the life that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be used by you to bring life into this world, to be able to bring uh, that life into the world, to uh, raise it up and to be able to um, uh, lead it, teach it, guide it uh, along the way. Uh, such that they reach the age where they too can become servants of you uh, and uh, be your ambassadors and uh, your witnesses as well. Uh, Father, for um, uh, those that have entered the ministry, uh, those who have recently been approved to enter the ministry, uh, we give you thanks for their diligence. We give you thanks for their um, hearing the call as well as responding to the call for the sacrifices that they've made, for the sacrifices that their congregations made, the prayers that they have made, the, the sacrifices of the family, all of that, Lord, that, uh, that you would use these people uh, uh, as our fellow brothers and sisters uh, to lead us, uh, to comfort us, uh, to shepherd us, uh, to, to be um, those leaders that you have called and purposed them to be. Uh, Lord, we are uh, really humbled uh, in all of the things that you are out and about up to. We thank you for the promises that we stand firm on, uh, that even as the, the world around us is uh, extremely wishy-washy and just blowing with the wind one way or the other, uh, that we can stand firmly on your, your truth, stand firmly on your word, stand firmly on uh, the promise of eternal life, uh, the blessings that we have as being your sons and daughters. Uh, Father, again, help us to continue to be those ones uh, that would see, that would hear, uh, that would do, uh, that uh, all that may see us may see you, uh, your son in us, uh, and be drawn to you, uh, that they may join uh, the ranks and uh, join us in the kingdom of heaven as well. Uh, we thank you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you will, turn to your Bible. Uh, we're still in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we're still in chapter 10. Um, uh, I'll tell you ahead of time, uh, my eyes were bigger than um, I knew them to be. Um, we were going to be going through verses 27 through 31. I'm going to read the entire passage, but I'm going to tell you ahead of time, we're only going to make it through 27. <laughs> we're only going to make it through one verse today. Uh, and uh, we will be picking up the rest of those uh, later next week, I think. Um, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to not finish this up, but um, um, again, my eyes were, were much bigger uh, than the time frame allotted. Um, so I'm going to also remind you that I typically read from the King James, but uh, for some reason or another, when I put the verses into um, my sermon program yesterday, uh, I forgot to change it to the King James. So I'm going to have to read from the ESV both the, the whole passage here as well as we're only going to get to the one verse today. So um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read from the ESV. I remind you again that this is the Word of God, uh, that it has been protected, it has been uh, provided for us uh, through uh, many different ways. And for those of you who uh, were uh, attending the, uh, the recent Bible study on the English translations, uh, uh, I hope you have, I, I know you have, a better appreciation for the sacrifices that even people here uh, in the last 500 years have gone through, that you might have in your hands today the Word of God in English, in English, because there have been many, many efforts in the past to stop you from having that. Mark chapter 10, verse 27 through 31, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. 
Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last First, let's pray. Father God, we just, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would have us this morning, Lord, that it would um, guide us and direct us, that we might hear with our ears and that our hearts and our minds may be open to your word, that we may draw closer to you, and that we may be strengthened in our faith. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm sure you all recognize that as a small portion of what we tend to refer to as the Lord's Prayer, but it's probably better described as the Disciples' Prayer, as it is the way in which Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray, as recorded by Matthew during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. As such, it is a model, it is not a formula, it is a model of how we should pray, and not something that even Jesus himself would have prayed, for he was and remains sinless and would have had no need to ask God to forgive him for any trespasses. In the excerpt that I just recited, Jesus is teaching us to ask God as well as for us to have a sincere desire for his kingdom to come, for his will to be done here on earth as it already is in heaven. The implication then is that here on earth, God's will, in contrast to heaven, is not, is not being perfectly implemented and followed. And it's not because the animals, the insects, the fish, the birds, or even the weather isn't aligned with God's will. It's because of man's rebellion against God as evidenced by sin in our lives. Sin that makes us enemies of God and demands judgment for God is perfectly holy and perfectly just. Of course, not everyone believes that God even exists or that he even has a right to judge us. Likewise, not everyone believes that they've done anything that is so bad that they should be harshly judged. Marred by sin, our pride convinces us that no, that on one end of the spectrum, since there is no God or a so-called loving God wouldn't rightfully sentence us to eternal judgment, we have nothing to worry about. That's one end of the spectrum. While on the other end of the spectrum, surely we have the power or the ability to do things in order to appease God or to make it up to him, to pay the penalty, to atone for our mistakes, to put us back into a right standing with him. Now, I won't take the time today to address the first part of that spectrum, but instead we'll remind you of what the Apostle Paul tells us in his first chapter of the book of Romans with regard to man's disbelief or disregard of God and his creation, where Paul writes in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of, not the birds, not the animals, not the insects, of men, that's people, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. Putting our head in the sand and trying to suppress the truth or deny the truth about God and about our sin doesn't make God go away, nor does it make the consequences of our sins disappear. It simply reveals the existence of our sin and our continuing rebellion towards God. On the other end of the spectrum... Those who believe they can make it up to God through good works likewise fail to hear and understand God's own words, his actions, and his promises, and deceive themselves as well as any others who might listen to them. So although God has revealed himself to us as well as his will, the world insists on doing things in opposition to both God and his will, as well as distorting God's nature, his intentions, and his purposes. Over the past several weeks, we've seen the outright opposition, as well as this worldly distortion in action. 
The most recent example was the rich young ruler who knew he was missing something with regard to his salvation, although he earnestly thought that he had done all the things he needed to do according to the Old Testament, but was unwilling to do the one thing that Jesus told him to do. Not that the act itself would have saved him, but that it would be a sign of a transformed heart if he had done so. What Jesus knew the rich young ruler was truly lacking. Jesus' own disciples had had their own misgivings surrounding his mission as the promised Messiah. And following the encounter with this, with, with this rich young ruler and Jesus' teaching regarding the difficulty of the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, they seem now thoroughly confused and in, and in, in exasperation ask the question in verse 26, well then who can be saved? Which is where we left off last week. Now, I typically don't end sermons on verses that effectively leave you hanging, as I don't like that technique being used on me, something that is quite common, I'm sure, that you are well aware of with regard to maybe things on TV, things that we hear on the radio or uh, other uh, media sources that we go ahead and access. Nonetheless, I purposely did that last week <clears throat> in the hopes that it would lead you, as well as I, to a deeper understanding of the importance of the resurrection, along with a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. In saying that, it is critical to appreciate not only the sincerity and the fervency of the disciples' question, but also to realize that Jesus has finally gotten them to a place where perhaps he can now correct them once and for all. The illustration of the impossibility of the camel going through the eye of a needle is quite telling and quite disturbing. It essentially closes the door with any thought, belief, or consideration with respect to man's ability to affect his own salvation. If you will, Jesus has eliminated all the erroneous man-centered paths to salvation. And having done so, he then reveals the one and only way that remains. As we read in verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not for God, for all things are possible with God. Now that's a short statement, a very short statement, but it has profound implications. Essentially and correctly, Jesus is telling them and us that there is nothing absolutely nothing that we can do to save ourselves. In hearing that, I would imagine that there are at least two reactions that are possibly present now in your minds. The first is one of denial. If not obvious outright denial, then perhaps a more subtle form of denial that is present in various types of heretical Christian teaching which goes something like this. Do you believe that when you were born, that you had the ability both to sin as well as the ability not to sin. Or to put it another way, do you believe that if you just tried hard enough or if you just exercised your human free will and chose not to sin, that you could have lived a life without sinning? As you think about that, let me briefly tell you about a man named Pelagius. Pelagius was a monk that lived in the late 300 and early 400 AD. Pelagius taught that when we are born, we have the ability and the freedom to choose good, to choose good over evil, the ability to sin, as well as the ability not to sin. He said that people fall into sin, into sin by choosing to sin by following Adam's example but could also be saved simply by choosing to follow Jesus' example and not sin. So again, I present the question. Do you believe that when you were born, in addition to having the ability to sin, do you believe you also had the innate ability not to sin? Essentially, the question boils down to the following. Can we be saved through our own efforts in the exercise of our free will, or are we only able to be saved by the sovereign grace of God? Or to put it one last way, is it possible for man to come to God on his own, or does it require something from God first? 
The belief that human beings are born innocent, morally neutral, and have the ability to choose to sin or not to sin is known as Pelagianism and was condemned as heretical at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. Why? Well, the short answer is because the Bible teaches that God's saving, saving grace is absolutely necessary and that people are totally depraved and born with a sin nature that makes them unable to live a sinless life. Or to put it even shorter, the Bible teaches that Christ had to, had to come and to die for us that no one is able to simply choose to live their life sin-free. So, if we want to really condense what Pelagius is erroneously taught, he taught that since man was 100% able to save himself, to live a morally sinless life, we need 0% of help from God, and we can still obtain 100% salvation. I suspect that since we are looking at this verse here in Mark 10:27 that says, with man it is impossible, meaning that man can't obtain salvation on his own, and the fact that most, if not all of you, are saved by trusting in the atonement that Christ brought for, bought for us on the cross, that you probably don't agree with Pelagius. However, some might be thinking, or who are going to be thinking as they listen to this later, some may be thinking that there still may be some level of cooperation some level of cooperation between man and God with regard to salvation. Maybe 100% man and 0% God isn't right. But what about 1% man and 99% God? Or even 10% man and 90% God? And thinking about it this way, perhaps we are willing to acknowledge that man is not perfect and definitely tainted by sin, but not to the point where we still can't cooperate with God with God's savings grace, a little. That there is still some goodness in us that we can choose to exercise, in fact, to seek God on our own without having to rely on God doing 100% of the work. So in contrast to Pelagius, who contended that we are not totally depraved, perhaps we are only partially depraved. We understand that we are sinful, but on our own, we can still recognize the truth cooperate with God's savings grace, and in fact, take the first step towards Christ on our own, relying on the cross then for the completion of our salvation. Well, how does that sound to you? Well, that teaching is known as semi-Pelagianism. And the same Bible verses that refute Pelagianism also refute semi-Pelagianism. I won't go too deeply here, but again, in the book of Romans, the Apostle, the Apostle Paul provides clear teaching on this as he writes in chapter 3. As it is written, none. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Paul makes it abundantly clear that no one has the ability to choose to do good. No one has the ability to seek God on their own. No one has the ability to understand and to choose to be righteous. All, all have turned aside. All have become worthless. Maybe we would be a little more comfortable hearing it from Jesus directly. In John's gospel, after Jesus fed the 5,000, Jesus sensed that the people were so stirred up that they were going to come and take him by force and make them, make him their king. So Jesus evades them and withdraws to the mountain by himself. Later that evening, with no sign of Jesus, the disciples go down to the Sea of Galilee where they get into a boat. They start heading for Capernaum. As they were rowing across, a great wind comes up and is blowing against them. After fighting the wind for some time, they saw Jesus walking, walking on the sea, coming to their boat, which frightened them. As he approached, he told them not to be frightened. And once he got in, they were immediately on the shore there at Capernaum. The next day, the crowds on the other side are still looking for Jesus. 
But they knew that he had not gotten into the boat with the disciples. Still un unable to find Jesus where they are, they get into boats and they go to Capernaum in search of Jesus over there. When they get there, they find Jesus. And, they, and after asking him, when did you get here? Jesus has, has a detailed discussion with them regarding their unbelieving hearts, them not understanding the signs that he had already shown them, and their request for yet more signs. He then tells them that he is the bread of life, that whoever comes to him shall not hunger, that whoever believes in him shall not thirst. However, he goes on to tell them that although they have seen him, they still do not believe in him even though he has come down from heaven, not according to his own will, but by the will of the Father. He goes on further to explain that the will of the Father is that everyone that looks on him as the Son and believes will have eternal life and that he would raise them up on the last day. In the course of this discussion, they grumble amongst themselves, reflecting more on Jesus' humanity, being the son of Joseph, in contrast to him, coming down from the Father in heaven. To which Jesus then replies, no one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he goes on to say, I will raise him up on the last day. This is John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Again, the clear and plain teaching here is that it is impossible for anyone, man or woman, adult or child, to cooperate in any way and seek God first. Jesus says he or she must be drawn. And at that time, it came from the Father, and then after Pentecost, by the Holy Spirit. Equally plain was at that time, with that group of people, they had yet to be drawn, even though they had seen the signs and even, and, and, and even eaten at the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. And in case you're wondering, like I said earlier, we're not going to get to the remainder of the verses today, but we'll pick up on them next week. But to help us perhaps more fully understand and appreciate verse 27 here, which I haven't even touched yet on the last part, which also clearly teaches that whereas salvation by man's works are impossible, that they are not impossible with God, through whom all things are possible, I'm going to close here with the first eight verses from chapter 2 of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Although all scripture is important and inspired by the Holy Spirit, these verses in particular help to solidify the point that Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples here in Mark chapter 27. I mean, uh, chapter 10, verse 27. As I read these verses, listen for the clear teaching of the depravity of man, the need of God's grace with respect to our salvation, and the absence of any works that we can bring to that table. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, Paul writes, and you were dead. Dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, gotta love those words, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you 
have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Satan's ways, man's ways, and the ways of the world typically are not in agreement with God's ways or the kingdom of God. God's good and perfect will is exactly what we need. But because of our sinful nature, it is not typically what we want. And to make matters worse, without God's grace, we don't even recognize that his will is what we need. On his way to the cross, Jesus is trying to convey to all, but specifically to his disciples, the significance of what we need and how God's will is bringing it about. For God knows with certainty, with certainty, that without the cross, without God's grace on display and poured out on the cross by his son, that the answer to the question, then who can be saved, is no one. But what is impossible for man is not impossible for God. Thanks then be to God that he is God and may his kingdom and his will reign over us as it does already in heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. I don't necessarily believe that there's anyone here who believes any of those heretical teachings that we briefly went over. It is, though, those teachings that, that, and or just those attitudes that are prevalent in our society and in, 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 in the culture. And yes, there are some churches. There are some churches that do believe that man does play a part, that they can cooperate with God, that God does not have to move, that you do not have to move first in our direction, that we were not dead in our trespasses. I don't know how they get around Ephesians. I don't know how they can't see your word. I don't know how they can't understand. It's, it's, it's sin. It's the depravity that we have. Father, again, I, I, I don't think there's, there's anyone here who is confused by that. But we will encounter them. And we need to be ready to give, to give a response in terms of it. But Father, help us, help us even as we, as we fully appreciate and maybe comprehend the incredible gift that you have given to us by your grace. The salvation that we enjoy today, the inheritance that is promised to us, help us to really fully appreciate just how significant your will, your sending of Jesus to become our sacrificial lamb, the perfect lamb of God, that would have the ability to take away not only the power of sin in our lives, but the penalty. May that appreciation, especially over these next two weeks, fill our hearts, our minds, our souls, our prayer life. May it fill our lips as we express it to others. May it fill our days, our actions, that others may see it in us. That you would use us to help bring others into your kingdom as you bring your kingdom here to this earth. We are so very grateful. 
It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is... 376. 376. First verse.